Hello, everyone. I'm Bob Dempsey, and on behalf of our department, I want to give an update on the COVID situation. I purposely chose an inauguration day because I want to speak about COVID and healthcare in the context of government. And I want to talk about how that interaction of government and healthcare defines each other. And it also explains our recent past and it helps us predict our future, which I think is a very important thing. Now, clearly, especially these past few weeks have been a time of great turmoil, but I want for everyone these to be a time of hope. I wish to talk about COVID, its devastation. I wish to talk about science and its vaccines. I wish to talk about the role of government in healthcare and healthcare in defining a government. I've spent a good number of decades trying to establish healthcare systems in developing countries around the world. And I can assure you the defining nature of success is if the people are able to rule themselves and if the government is willing to help out. That's really true in every government. That's really what's special about ours. It's why we really can't understand COVID without understanding that. Think about what's happened recently. We've had the takeover of Congress, the People's House, by a mob riot, never before in history. We've had the inauguration of a new president. We've done that 47 times, just two and a half hours ago. We've had a record number of cases and deaths of a tremendous pandemic and never before seen restrictions on our lives by a global pandemic that some people denied it was even taking place and therefore it spread. We've lost travel. Many of our families members have lost jobs. Activities have changed. We haven't been able to make new friends. Um, family visits have changed forever and riots have occurred and occurred repeatedly, primarily because of fear and misinformation. So where we need science, we need information, we need governments, we need governments by the people. Because the alternative is darkness. And this is the week we honor Martin Luther King we quote his approach to this. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. So let's shine some light on this situation, if you'll allow me to share my screen. Today, we have a new government, a new president. I'm not really going to be talking about people or personalities. I want to talk about the people, that is you and I, the things that define this country. Because it's not so important to me that there's a new person. It's that we could do that. Because when you think about the inaugurations of presidents, the defining moment of our country was that the strength of our nation is based on an orderly transition of power determined by the election by the people and the rule of law. That's never happened before in other countries till it happened here. And when it doesn't happen, when laws without the people, it's a despot, when there is not an orderly transition, I assure you the autocrats do not look out for the people. So it's this man, John Adams, who in 1797, March 4th, in Congress Hall in Philadelphia, swore to protect the Constitution of the United States as the new president, the second president. People go to Philadelphia to see the Freedom uh, Hall, Independence Hall, to see the Liberty Bell. I turn right and go to Congress Hall because that's where our government first defined an orderly transition of government by the people. Never before that happened. It is what defines us. We almost lost that recently. To understand the importance of that, I want to talk again about a different person, a person many of you have never heard of, and that's this guy, Winfield Scott, okay? At 74, he was still general of the Army. He was general of the U.S. Army, lieutenant general, 
These are posts that only Washington had held. He held them for 44 years. In the 19th century, he was considered to be the greatest general of the century. And that was by the Duke of Wellington, the guy who defeated Napoleon, thought Winfield Scott was the best general. You've never heard of him. But this guy, in his near retirement, met a mob that descended on the U.S. Capitol on February 21st, 1861, to stop the Congress of the U.S. from counting the electoral ballots of the elected president. That mob knew that that count was supervised by the acting vice president, who had just lost the election. And that will allow them to overthrow the government by invalidating the election by the people. It was Winfield Scott at age 74 that met the mob and stopped them. And when one of the senators who was in favor of overthrowing the government said, would you, would you arrest me for treason, General Scott? He said, no, I'll blow your head off, the rule of law. And what happened 13 days later was this. Lincoln was inaugurated. This was March 4th, 1861. It took place on the east portico of a capital that was still under construction, just as our country is still under construction. And nowadays, presidents are inaugurated on the west portico, which has a larger viewing area. But nevertheless, this was an important defining period for us to have a government, which I'll argue is necessary for us to have a health care system. It was Lincoln on that day that said, I'm loath to close my address. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. Until that time when we are again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. This is leadership. So why, why would I talk about this? What does this have to do with COVID? Well, it's very important. COVID-19 changed this recent election, and that changes our approach to COVID. We have to understand that, because to get ourselves out of this, we have to all work together, and in the United States, that's by a government. So where are we? Well, in a bad spot. Two million people have died worldwide. That estimate is probably 50% under because of the extra deaths in the countries that don't count closely. In the United States, 400,000 have died from COVID. That estimate is about 20% undercounted when you look at the unexpected deaths. And this has touched us all. Wisconsin is coming out of a major surge, one of the worst in the world. Three, three months ago. Many things are happening that can cause fear. New mutations, cases touching close to home, very young people having strokes from COVID, our staff having COVID, our patients having COVID. But there is hope here. The flu outbreak of this year, you remember that? It never happened. It means that what we're doing, what we've been doing to mask, to isolate, is succeeding. We can stop flu, but we can't stop COVID alone. We need science. We need the vaccines. New mutations are an issue, but don't be afraid. We have 36 different vaccines in development. That's because we know about mutations. None of the new mutations has successfully outwitted the two successful vaccines in this country. The other 36 I'll talk about, some are wise, some are unwise, but it is a possibility and that's because of science. What can science change? Well, we have vaccinated several million people in this country so far. We need 200 million. That's an important figure. And we have a world to care for. That's equally important. There are still only two vaccines approved in the US. Both are a new technology. 
both can be mass produced. Both must be mass produced if we're to be successful. We are well begun through phase 1A, which was just the physicians. Okay. But we must move to 1B. And what will that be? We now know that there are two possible strategies. We vaccinate the people who are most likely to get the disease and die from it. These are nursing home patients. One third of our deaths have been nursing home patients. Therefore, they are being vaccinated now. We then have many thoughts and we combine them. So we're looking at who is essential to us, police and fire, some uh, very important industries. One that has lobbied strongly is teachers, because if we can vaccinate teachers, we may be able to open up the schools again and restore some order to our society. Makes sense, but we have to have enough vaccine for them. And we have now approved that the next step in the state of Wisconsin will be the older patients because they die at a geometrically increasing rate from this very severe disease. And so 65 and above are next, and this will be next week. But remember, Wisconsin has 700,000 people that fall in that category, and we have 70,000 doses of vaccine. So only if we have an organized, scientific, and recognized by the government effort to make those vaccines, I'm talking War Powers Act, where just as we could instruct companies to make ventilators and face masks, remember when we were doing that in April? We can, can, we can instruct pharmacy, pharmaceutical companies to make these vaccines. That's what we need to do because if we are to orderly move through our society and get to that magic number of 200 million vaccinated, which will not allow the vaccine enough targets for it to continue to go at this rate, we're going to have to organize. I can assure you we can organize the distribution of the vaccine. We can computerize and appointments and we can mass produce it. Seven and eight lanes beginning vaccinations. We need the doses and a government can provide that. Other governments are trying that. And what they're doing really defines a lot about what that government's like. The UK, India, and China are bringing out their own vaccines. Each of them has come out, I would say, faster than they would have been approved in this country, or they've not been approved here yet. And it's unknown. The vaccine in China may be only 50% effective, as opposed to 95% effective for the two that have been improved in the US. And that's a problem. Their theory was they would give one dose to everybody, half of them would be protected, that's better than where they were now. That is a theory. I don't think it's very smart. If you really want to stop this, you need effective vaccinations, and that's two doses with the two that have been approved so far. There are others in production that are one-dose vaccines. So the key is to use it the way it was scientifically designed, not to change it based on a government or a phase. They are effective against mutations so far. There will be new mutations. There always are. We've been tracking the COVID virus by its mutations. All, the, all viruses make mutations, and we can say, aha, this mutation tells me this is that strand, or that is that strand. We have found one mutation that actually changes the infectiousness of the, of the COVID, not its mortality, but how infectious it is. That is still stopped by the vaccinations thus far. But to be effective, we're going to really have to remember that there are other countries, Congo, Nigeria, Uganda, that cannot provide this. We have to. They live by hope that we'll remember our responsibility to our fellow man and woman. And now you see why governments are so important, because it plays a role in those countries, in their health system. I know that. I've been expelled, detained, etc., by governments because my health care strategy 
may have educated people that may then rebel against the, their government. That's a problem. It's a problem providing health care. But in these countries of hope, Congo, Nigeria, Uganda, Myanmar, etc., Bolivia, the world that we care for, we need to play a role. And the importance of people to pick their government peacefully and exchange power by rule of law is the experience that we would hope for. Because if you look where we are and where we should be, you begin to see that hope comes not from just testing, but from scientific change. And Dempsey's rule is change is often good, but it's always hard. So we have to work hard. We know right now that the University of Wisconsin has instituted a testing program, piloted at the University of Illinois and successful there, where once to twice a week, everybody gets tested. You're coming in a university building, you're tested. In this way, they're able to isolate and selectively decrease. So the University of Illinois is down to like 1% infectious, as opposed to 20 and 30 and 40% we were seeing before. And this is important. This new government that we have instituted only three hours ago must comment on the vaccinations. They must close this gap. We have 600 and 690,000 elders in this state. We want to get vaccinated. We better get the dosing up and soon because our society cannot mask and isolate enough. We do it enough to stop flu, but not COVID. So as this 1B rolls out, we need literally a War Powers Act for that. I assure you the medical industry, the medical profession, all of us can get the doses out. And my hope therefore is for the spring. Uh, I realize how we, much we have grown. That gives me hope. We've grown to where we can effectively attack a pandemic in our midst. We can keep each other safe, but not forever. The vaccination is the next step. And we sincerely hope that we will see a vaccination that will be effective for the world. We can't take the Pfizer vaccine to Congo and deep freeze it. We need one that's cheap, one dose, not frozen, and easy to transport worldwide. We will get there but we need to work quickly. And that's science and that's government will, and that's people, because the government isn't different, they are us. So my hopes for the spring, my realization is how we have grown as a people. And my quote is again, Martin Luther King, when he said life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Well, that's what makes me proud. That's why I'm in medicine. Can you imagine how wonderful we have it, that our work is something we can do for others and be proud of? Indeed, it's pertinent to my entire life because my mother sent her large family out every day, imploring us to act in a way in which we would be proud, proud of what we are. Indeed, it is the definition of my name in Gaelic. So, I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud to be part of medicine. And I do feel if we organize vaccination program properly, we will solve this problem. And then we will solve it for the world because that's our responsibility. And you see, to do that, we need the health system and the government system working together with information, with facts, with science. Because when people have information, they aren't afraid or misinformed. They don't riot, they work together. So yeah, I have a lot of hope today. And I hope you do as well, because you make me proud. Thank you so much.